Friends, colleagues, students and visitors, welcome to the Melbourne School of Design Dean's Lecture Series, showcasing eminent international professionals, professionals and leaders in the built environment. My name is Julie Willis and I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning. I begin this evening's proceedings by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which this event is taking place, the land of the Wurundjeri of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders and families, both past and present. Urban resilience is a topic which has been of significant interest to the faculty. Earlier this year, the Melbourne Sustainable Society Institute, housed here within the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning, hosted the Echo City World Summit for 2017. With nearly a thousand delegates from over 30 countries, the conversations held at the summit between academics, business leaders, not-for-profit and government representatives were invaluable for the ongoing challenge of building resilient cities. Tonight we build on those conversations and are extremely privileged to have Professor Christine Walmsler speak tonight. Christine is trained as an architect and urban planning planner with her research interests in company encompassing sustainable and inclusive city development and a focus on disaster risk reduction, climate change adaptation, resilience and urban transformation. Her expertise and leadership is evidenced by the many positions she holds. Professor at Lund University Centre for Sustainability Studies, Research Fellow at the Centre of National D Natural Disaster Science, Associate of Lund University Centre for Risk Assessment and Management, Honorary Research Fellow of the Global Urbanism Research Group, Global Development Institute of the University of Manchester, former co-director of the Centre for Societal Resilience and visiting professor, that, professor at the Technical University of Munich. Christine has worked and conducted research all over the world, including Brazil, Chile, Colombia, El Salvador, Germany, Guatemala, India, Kosovo, Mexico, Peru, the Philippines, Sweden, Tanzania, Togo, and the United Kingdom. Christine has published more than a thousand, a hundred academic papers, sorry, I've just put it up there a bit there. A hundred academic papers, popular scientific articles, guidelines, book chapters, and books on sustainable urban development and resilience, including her internationally recognized book titled Cities, Disaster, Risk, and Adaptation, published by Routledge. Increasingly, Christine is exploring the city-citizen relationships and the opportunities posed by urban and climate adaptation. I'm looking forward to gaining a small glimpse into Christine's work tonight. Please join me in welcoming Christine Walser. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for the generous introduction, a um, thousand publications, that was very generous. <laughs> um, and thanks to everyone for such a warm and friendly welcome to Melbourne. It's really a pleasure to be here. Now, in the next 40 minutes, I'm going to introduce the issue of mainstreaming climate adaptation in urban planning and governance. And how it is linked to urban resilience. I'm sure that everybody in this room is aware of the increasing challenges urban areas are facing and climate change is perhaps the most important. Today I don't want to talk about the challenges and the causes as such but we do have quite an agenda if we want to address the increasing hazards that, and disasters that are mainly caused by human activity. There's no doubt our cities need to become more hazard and disaster resilient. The question, however, is how? What we do know for sure is that every action our lack of action makes us either more resilient or more vulnerable. And this is probably especially true for urban actors such as architects and urban planners. But how can we knowingly take actions to make our societies more resilient? Let me start with the three aspects that I consider key to answering this question and which also form the three main messages of my presentation today. 
first. At the local level, increasing resilience through adaptation mainstreaming requires the active consideration and combination of five different types of measures to reduce risk. And if possible, these measures should be multi-purpose and thus not only focus on reducing climate risk. Second, to ensure the sustainable implementation of these measures, they need to be linked to different mainstreaming strategies at the local, institutional and the interinstitutional level. And third, put together, these measures and strategies have the potential to foster resilience by challenging common attitudes and paradigms at multiple levels of governance. So this means that they can work together in a way that they change or at least challenge um, current attitudes and paradigms. During my presentation, um, we will go through the different measures and the different strategies. And I'm also showing some concrete examples and related um, design principles for urban planning and governance. But first, let's take a step back. Let me start by presenting a simple framework that can help us planners, architects and other urban professionals to meaningfully link our work to climate adaptation. So if we work in hazard prone areas, so areas that are prone to floods, wind storms, um, drought, landslides, etc. So basically most areas, uh, then there are three traditional fields of activities. These are response, recovery and development. Now the sequence that unfolds is as follows. Response is what happens during and then the immediate aftermath of disasters or hazards. The aim is to save lives and elevate suffering. Hence the priority is to address basic needs such as temporary shelter, water, food and basic health care. The recovery phase follows the response phase. Recovery is about helping be people to get back to normal. Um, in other words, their former or possibly better living conditions. And then when the situation is again more or less under control, general de development work can continue. And in simple terms, this is about improving people's quality of life, well-being and reducing poverty. Obviously, this is a very, that was a very Ill simplified illustration and reality, um, these pro processes are not linear, they are circular, where development work is disrupted by hazards, which leads to and overlaps with response and recovery in a circular way. So looking at this cycle, you might ask, how are these traditional fields of activity related to hazard and climate risk reduction? Now the answer is that in contrast to response, recovery and development, risk reduction is a continuous process and a so-called cross-cutting topic, which means that it should not stand alone um, and has to be integrated or mainstreamed into all other phases, meaning response recovery and development. So how is this cycle then related to climate adaptation? I forgot to mention that risk reduction also forms part of so-called disaster risk management um, together with response and recovery. So how is this cycle then related to climate adaptation? Now, if we focus on climate hazards, we can say that risk reduction and climate adaptation basically share the same aim, which is to reduce climate risk. And importantly, both are cross-cutting topics and thus need to be mainstreamed. Hence, we can basically replace risk reduction with climate adaptation in this figure and importantly, today the focus is here on mainstreaming climate adaptation into development work. And this is due to the common understanding that a lack of adequate development 
our lack of adequate development planning is the main cause of our increasingly risky environments. And this brings us to our next question, which is what is adaptation mainstreaming? In simple terms, adaptation mainstreaming refers to the inclusion of climate adaptation considerations into all sector policy and practice, and thus also into urban planning and governance, in order to reduce climate risk. The concept has two main origins. On the one hand, it developed from risk reduction mainstreaming, which has been strongly promoted since the World Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction in Kobe in 2005, and which builds on experience in other cross-cutting domains, such as HIV AIDS and gender. On the other hand, it originates from Environmental Policy Integration, EPI, and in this context, climate policy mainstreaming. Now, the initial objective of climate policy mainstreaming was to integrate the objective of reducing greenhouse gas emissions into sectoral policies. But this focus has gradually broadened and nowadays also explicitly includes adaptation considerations. Now, understanding the mainstreaming concept is extremely relevant for our work. First, as I've just highlighted, because climate adaptation is a so-called cross-cutting topic and thus concerns urban planning. Second, as was highlighted in the latest IPCC report, although climate adaptation is widely advocated, it has not so far been implemented systematically. In fact, for many urban actors, it remains unclear how they can best mainstream this new approach into their daily work. So consequently, the question is, how can climate adaptation be systematically mainstreamed into urban planning and governance to ultimately increase resilience? So perhaps you remember the three key messages which I presented at the beginning of my presentation and that provided answers to this question. So let's look into them in more depth now. So first, at the local level, Mainstreaming climate adaptation requires the active consideration and combination of five different types of uh, measures to reduce risk. That is to reduce physical, environmental, social and economic factors and associated root causes. Imagine this situation where risk is caused by a potential hazard, here a landslide. So how can we reduce risk in such a situation? First, we can avoid hazard exposure. The aim is here to keep the hazard away from human settlements by moving away from it or not moving into hazard areas. Second, we can reduce hazard exposure. The, ha the aim is here also to keep hazards away from human settlement, but not by moving away from it, but by reducing hazard exposure on site. Now, this is often the most dominant approach in current planning practice. Third, we can reduce the vulnerability of the area that is exposed to a hazard. Here, we are not trying to keep the hazard away from human settlements. Instead, we create an environment that is able to live with hazards without losing its main functions. Obviously, this includes not only the reduction of physical vulnerability, as illustrated here, um, but also environmental, social and economic vulnerabilities. Fourth, we can ensure an effective response to hazards. Here, we prepare response mechanisms and structures before a potential hazard strikes. And finally, the fifth type of measure aims to ensure effective recovery from the impacts of a hazard. Here we prepare recovery mechanisms and structures again, again before a potential hazard strikes. Depending on the climate hazard, the specific activities will change. 
Nevertheless, conceptually speaking, the five different types of meshes do not change. For instance, this example shows a flat rather than a landslide. However, the principle is the same. To reduce risk, we can avoid hazard exposure. We can reduce hazard exposure on site. We can reduce the vulnerability, allowing us to live with the hazard. We can prepare an effective response and an effective recovery. But what would be concrete examples for each type of measure? Now, in general terms, there are so-called so grey, green and soft measures for all five types of measures. So, grey, green and soft solutions for all five types of measures. Grey solutions refer to physical or en engineering measures, such as levees, technical shading or technical drainage systems. Green solutions refer to the risk reduction through ecosystem services that are provided by green and blue uh, urban spaces. You may also have heard them called nature-based solutions. And finally, soft solutions encourage, encourage adaptive behavior by, for example, increasing awareness or by providing information and socioeconomic support for reducing risk. So let's have a look at some examples for each type of measure and approach. Examples of hazard avoidance, which is the first measure, are activities designed to move or resettle areas or critical infrastructure away from hazards or at least ensure that they do not develop into hazard-prone areas. Here, for instance, through signposting or the establishment of nature protection areas. Another example here um, is socioeconomic support or public areas such as parks or beach promenades that are designed to inhibit the development of housing in risk areas. When it comes to hazard reduction, which is the second measure, we can, for instance, reduce exposure to floods and erosion through the construction of embankments or breakwaters, through beach nourishment, restoring or managing mangroves, or improving water management in the outskirts of urban areas. In the case of landslides, we can st stabilize slopes through planting or building retention walls to so hold soil. Here, in this case, a combination of grey and green um, infrastructure elements. Soft measures can, for instance, include awareness raising to combat deforestation and thus reduce landslides risk. Vulnerability reduction is the third measure. Some examples for reducing flood vulnerability are building on stilts, here shown in different scales, the creation of buffer zones, retention ponds, or increasing the extent of permeable surfaces, for instance, through the promotion of green roofs, urban agriculture, or, like here in Melbourne, greening laneways. Regarding reducing heat vulnerability, we can also promote the use of drought-resistant plants and improve insulation. And in this context, not only grey, but also green elements, such as green facades or urban uh, green roofs, can play a role. Another important measure for vulnerability reduction is the inclusion of redundant elements in urban design. Here, the aim is to reduce dependency on one system, for instance, for heating, cooling, transportation or drainage. Some examples of soft measures for vulnerability reduction are awareness raising campaigns and tools, such as environmental traffic lights. This example here is from Manizales in Colombia. This is an example from Denmark, a so-called stormwater skate park, which serves as a retention pond during heavy, heavy rain. Now, creating space and events for social interactions, such as Sunday streets or so-called Malones Urbano in Chile, is another combined grey and soft measure.
When it comes to the fourth measure, that is response preparedness, the most typical measures are early warning systems, simulations and preparations for temporary shelter. Properly designed areas, areas can here provide space for temporary shelter or temporary protection, such as elevated green platforms during floods. Another example is the preparation of mechan mechanisms or structures that provide cooling during heat waves, for instance, by providing space, by, by, by providing access to air-conditioned public spaces, here libraries. Mobile planting systems or temporary fountains may also be used. Some more examples of response preparedness our uh, measures are shown here. We have here temporary floodgates, the fixation of manholes or devices to block wastewater or insects coming up through drain pipes into houses. All devices that can be installed if need be. When it comes to preparing for recovery, which was the fifth measure, the most typical measures are insurance policies that provide post-disaster compensation. Another example is the use of construction materials and green infrastructure elements that can easily recover or be replaced after hazard impacts. Or we can prepare for recovery assistance by, for instance, stipulating areas that can be used for accommodation during reconstruction. We can also prepare to clear or use rubble or prepare for other recovery support. Examples of soft measures are awareness raising campaigns and information on what to do after certain hazards, um, which can, for instance, be displayed, displayed or shown in so-called climate parks or by arts-based projects such as the Refuge Project at Arts House here in Melbourne. From these different examples, it is clear that each type of measure um, offers different opportunity. Uh, that it shows that each type of context offers different opportunities and approaches for climate adaptation, both low and high tech, from which we can learn. But why is it so important to know and ultimately address all five types of measures to reduce um, climate risk? It is important because local resilience depends on the inclusiveness and flexibility of the combined set of adaptation measures deployed rather than the effectiveness of a single measure. By inclusiveness, I mean the use of not just one or two but all of the five different measures to reduce risk. And flexibility relates to the number and diversity implemented for each type of measure. So different design principles can be extracted from what we have discussed so far. First, when we design projects, we have to include and combine all five measures if we want to comprehensively reduce risk and create redundancy. So if we take the example of a new development, for instance, a park, all five types of measures could be easily addressed. Its location can be chosen specifically to prevent people moving into risk areas and to reduce hazard exposure of the surrounding areas. At the same time, its design can include elements such as playgrounds, skate parks, etc that can serve also as water retention areas. It can also include gray, green and blue elements that provide cooling during hot weather or protection during heavy rain. And elevated platforms can be designed to prepare for temporary shelter during response or recovery. And last but not least, it could be designed to display information to increase awareness of different risk redu reducing activities. Second, in order to address risk comprehensively and create redundancy for each 
type of measure, we need a combination of activities that address related physical, environmental, social and economic aspects of risk through a combination of grey, green and soft solutions. Obviously, only addressing physical risk through grey solutions is certainly not enough and might even lead to increasing risk. At the same time, physical measures can become an important entry point for reducing broader socioeconomic vulnerabilities, for instance, by linking them to professional training and economic activities that support those most vulnerable. Third, we need to design activities that are not only multi-hazard, but also multi-purpose. Solutions that deliver additional benefits are crucial, especially given in the increasing urban challenges, conflicting priorities, the resultant difficulty in financing climate adaptation, and the need to increase urban actors' willingness to implement adaptation measures. We know that adaptation measures can, for instance, be designed to simu simultaneously enhance biodiversity, improve environmental quality, contribute to economic activities and support social well-being. For instance, the green nature-based solutions that I mentioned earlier. Or an example of a multi-purpose grey measure would be a seawall that is also a recreational bike, bike path or a skate park that is at the same time a water retention area. But so far we have only looked at the local level and sustainable change will remain elusive as long as our understanding of mainstreaming remains naive because organizations themselves also need to change rather than simply mainstreaming change on the ground. In fact, all the examples we have seen so far apply to the local or operational level. But if we want to ensure the sustainable implementation of these measures, there must also be changes at the institutional and the inter-institutional level in order to institutionalize adaptation so that it's mainstreaming at local level becomes a standard procedure, including the creation of mechanisms and structures for monitoring and learning. To ensure that organizations themselves can continue to function in times of climate change, to cooperate in creating a multi-level governance system for climate adaptation, and to drive improved education and <coughs> science policy integration on adaptation and mainstreaming. So this makes a total of six mainstreaming strategies that operate at three levels. And to help you remember them, here are some cinnamon buns, or in Swedish, kanelbullar, which is a very important part of Swedish culture. Last week, October 4th, was the National Cinnamon Bun Day in Sweden, and I don't think that there are any Swedes who don't like cinnamon buns. And you probably have some, some things similar, or you know them from IKEA. So let's zoom in. In the center, the first two strategies focus on the local or household level. So these relate to how the five, sorry, how the five types of measures to reduce climate risk can be integrated into on-the-ground initiatives, either by adding on new activities or by modifying existing ones. Three mainstreaming strategies focus on the institutional level of the, um, of the implementing organization. They address institutions' internal organization and cooperation together with their policies and regulations. Now, concrete measures might, for instance, involve the creation of interdepartmental working groups for climate adaptation, changes in mandates or funding mechanisms, and the inclusion of adaptation considerations in comprehensive and detailed planning and related planning tools. And the sixth strategy focuses on the inter-institutional level, that is, related sector work and professions in general, and in the larger system. 
It addresses external cooperation with other organizations, including businesses, universities and citizens. It might, for instance, involve joint risk and vulnerability mapping or municipal participation in regional innovation platforms to create new cooperation and business models for managing and planning climate adaptation. So mainstreaming thus needs to take place at three levels in order to achieve sustainable change by uniting top-down and bottom-up efforts that together can lead to an, a holistic and distributed governance system for climate adaptation. Now this shows that adaptation mainstreaming is inherently linked to the concept of resilience because it ultimately aims to challenge common ideas, attitudes or activities and change dominant paradigms at multiple levels of governance, including the root causes of risk. So mainstreaming, mainstreaming works, for instance, towards resilience by expanding the focus from preventing or resisting hazards to a broader systems framework in which we learn to live and cope with an ever-changing and sometimes risky environment. It should also lead to a more inclusive planning and complementary risk governance system. And this in turn translates into the ability to change in response to altered circumstances and to carry on functioning even when individual parts fail. If we formulate this into a design principle, it means that we have to design and implement local measures in such a way that they are supported by and linked to all levels of mainstreaming. I have seen good examples of this in different places. What they have in common is that they manage to find innovative ways for linking socioeconomic and physical risk reduction on the ground with improving organizational structures, cooperation mechanisms and planning frameworks at multiple levels. One aspect which is in this context, however, however often not given enough attention is the importance of involving citizens. And citizens' involvement is crucial. First, climate impacts are local, which also means that local people are the first to arrive on the scene. And second, increasing climate extremes have shown to lead to a shift in responsibility from governance to citizens. And this citation of a city official in Germany makes it clear, who said, we are more and more dependent that everybody, that every citizen becomes himself active and tries to get engaged because the city cannot handle it anymore by itself. The city depends on citizens' support. Now, despite the situation, city-citizen cooperation for climate change adaptation is still rare and too often existing interactions between municipalities and citizens turn into struggles. Now, this is unfortunate as we have to know about people's view and views and perceptions, actions and capacities if we want to formulate sustainable interventions. And the few exceptions of city-citizen cooperation for climate adaptation takes so far mostly place in pilot projects. So here we see an interesting case from Malmö in Sweden, where the open stormwater management technique designed to reduce stream velocity and sedimentation was actually developed by a resident and was later patented. Now, the involvement of citizen, citizens in the process of de developing adaptation strategies is also, so far, hardly existent. Even in so-called forerunner communities in Europe, for instance, Germany and Sweden. You only have to look, it, look at the red circles. Now, the analysis here showed that citizen involvement was often either fully absent or only involved one of events. 
And I believe that the development and recent revision of the climate adaptation strategy here in Melbourne City is actually, with its comparatively extensive community engagement, a positive exception to this situation. It is thus important to add another design principle here, which is the need to put people in the center and to match different actors' views, efforts and capacities. This also includes the consideration of people's inner dimensions and existing power structures in order to ensure the adequate involvement of the most vulnerable members of the society. People's inner dimensions, that is, their emotions, mindsets, associated values and beliefs, play an important role if we want to achieve sustainable change. It is crucial to take account of people's different rationalities because too often we wrongly assume that there is a simple direct link between evidence and behavior, policy and implementation. Individual inner dimensions influence, for instance, risk perception, environmental behavior, and people's motivation to take or support climate adaptation initiatives. At institutional and interinstitutional level, they can relate to or influence climate communication, social justice, and organizational reliability and innovation. So, to sum up, my three key messages are first, at the local level, increasing resilience through adaptation mainstreaming requires the active consideration and combination of five different types of measures to reduce climate risk on the ground. And possibly, possibly these should be multi-purpose and thus not only focus on reducing climate risk. Second, to ensure the sustainable implementation of these measures, they need to be linked to different mainstreaming strategies at the local, institutional and interinstitutional le level. Third, taken together, these measures and strategies have the potential to foster resilience by challenging common attitudes and paradigms at multiple levels of governance. And therefore, adaptation mainstreaming can be seen as an important pathway to foster urban resilience. And these three key messages can, as shown here, be translated in a set of specific design principles focused on creating inclusive and flexible local measures on the ground, the institutionalization of climate adaptation, and on creating sustainable change at a larger systems level. Now, the three key messages and the associated design principles listed here again are embedded in the overall framework for linking climate adaptation to urban sector work, which I presented at the very beginning of my presentation. So I sincerely hope that this framework and the design principles can be an inspiration to your work, to all our work, and ultimately make a difference, especially to those who are most at risk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine. It's been absolutely fabulous to listen to this. And the, the framework that you're talking about gives a, a really good way of thinking about how we can actually make some changes from right down to the individual level, right through to policy and government that is so important. The linking through of those um, are the only ways that we're going to make a real difference. So thank you so much for it. It's been fabulous.
And thank you to all of you for coming tonight. It's been wonderful to experience this uh, and we look forward to seeing you again at another Dean's Lecture in the future in 2018. Thank you very much. Thank you.